So when we talk about the plastics, it's like drugs. Uh, we spend so much time trying to stop the drugs. And but if we had people that wouldn't use the drugs, there wouldn't be any use for them. So if the people exactly. were, were, were more mindful and avoided using plastic, there wouldn't be as much demand to make it. Right. But it's almost the way our society runs. Like you were mentioning earlier, Jim, you get a plastic takeout cup. You Your food from your restaurant comes in plastic, plastic cutlery, plastic bags. Of the, it's everywhere. So it's really hard to break that habit when temptation is all around you. Yes. And people will think, well, just this one time, I won't do it again. And I was doing some statistics on recycling. Less less than 9% of plastic is recycled. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. And um, it's not always easy for the person themselves to do recycling. So for example, where I live, uh, my apartment does not do recycling because it would mean uh, they would have to raise rent for all the tenants uh, and it would it wouldn't be worth it financially for the complex. Um, so I again, this is where when I went to Europe, I really think while change is hard, we can adopt practices from other countries. So for example, they pre-sort all of their trash. So they pre-sort their numbered plastics, they pre-sort cardboard, they pre-sort paper, they pre-sort glass. And then when it gets to the recycling plant, there's less chance of, you know, cross-contamination of types of recycled products. Um, and again, I know it's a change, but I'm pretty sure most Americans, if you ask them, once you, once we get into a new habit, it takes a little while, but I'm pretty sure most people want to keep our planet clean for future generations. Well, I would, uh, I would certainly hope so. A few years ago, my son got into uh, sailboating, and mm -hmm. uh, he bought himself a smaller sailboat. And he tells me that there are the anchors now have to be specially designed to go through the plastics that are cover the mm -hmm. bottom of uh, the lakes and the oceans. That's, yeah, they've found plastics as deep as the Marianas Trench. It's mind-boggling. Yes, yes. So I think I perhaps you could correct me, but when I was looking it up all these things, it says the average person ingests enough plastic like the size of a credit card, I don't know, maybe once a year, or uh, I don't know how this could possibly be healthful. Uh, so... Where do you hope that your research will lead to, Maureen? Yeah, great question. So my goal of my research is I'm working with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and um, I want to make sure that my research is open access journals. So typically you have two kinds of scientific journals, those that require payment to read articles or a subscription, and then those that are what we call open access. So the whole public can view it no matter who you are. Um, so I'm hoping to make my my uh, dissertation and then also the papers that come out of that open access and to give that data back to the national parks to hopefully use for future legislative action um, to, you know, help say so that if the government is ever like, well, where is the proof that your, your beaches are polluted? Well, look, here's a, a scientific study that we can replicate in the coming years to track, you know, how pollution is related to the abundance of wildlife on the beach. Um, because my hypothesis is, is that the more microplastics we find, the less animals we're going to find. So tell us about the, your collection process. What does, what exactly does, does it go through? You get, a, you go on the beach and then. Yeah, uh, I will do my best to explain this. Um, so we do something called taking sediment cores. So imagine taking your water glass and like turning it upside down and digging it into the sand and then you pull it back out and you get a known volume of sand, like eight ounces, for example. Uh, we do that and we do what are called uh, surveys at the shoreline where the waves are breaking. And so we do side by side 
sediment cores um, down the beach. And uh, we do five of them in parallel. And so they're 15 meters long by 10 meters apart. So it's like a 15 meter by 50 meter rectangle. Um, so the idea is we get like a representative view of each beach every single time. And we can go back, we have the exact GPS coordinates to resample each time. Um, so the idea is we take two cores next to each other for each line. One of the cores is just sand and we put it in a metal paint can um, and it's 10 centimeters in diameter by 10 centimeters in height. So that's about a quart. We, we put them in a quart size paint can uh, and then we go back and we measure that sand and we try to figure out how many plastics per quart of sand is there basically. And then what we do is we take a second uh, sediment core right next to it. And for that one, we sieve the sand or we strain the sand through a what's called a sieve. It's like a specialized pasta strainer with really, really tiny mesh. Um, and we collect all of the marine animals that live in the sand. Uh, and so then what we can do is we can relate how many plastics did we find in the sand to how many marine inverts did we find in the sand? Oh. So we'll collect those animals in mason jars, <laughs> quart size mason jars, because we can't use plastic. Um, we will screen them and we'll wash that water, like buffered seawater and all the critters into the mason jar. And then we will preserve them in 10% formalin with a, a biogenic dye called rose bengal. Um, and so what it does is it helps us distinguish the animals from all the rest of the sh shells in the sample. Um, so anything that is alive or has cells like a plant or an animal gets stained hot pink, like, like Barbie or legally blonde hot pink. Okay. Um, so it makes it really easy to pick out afterwards. So then we can say, okay, on this beach, we found a ratio of five microplastics to 10 animals. You know, that's kind of what we're hoping to fit, determine. Um, and so some animals that we find include mole crabs, clams, uh, worms, and then also amphipods. They're like the, think of them as like the tiny cousins of shrimps that live in the sand. And they're kind of nature's little trash compactors and they eat all the detritus and icky stuff out of the sand ah. and keep the beach sand clean. So that's the idea. Obviously corporations are not going to stop their cash cow operation unless they're forced to. And mm -hmm. the only people who could force them through regulations would be the legislative bodies, the government. Uh, so how what is your hope to be able to present solid facts and information? What we try to do is help people. I, as a therapist, Marine, try to help people understand, are we making our decisions based on beliefs or are we making our decisions based on facts? And I believe right. that I believe that a lot of the climate denier individuals are basing their information on beliefs rather than facts. Yeah, so that's really the point of this project is to get some solid facts. Um, and the reason we're doing why we're focusing on animals that live in the sand is one, I'm an invertebrate zoologist, so I study things without a backbone. Uh, but two, we already know that larger animals like turtles and dolphins and fish eat plastic. But what about the bottom of the food chain? What about the stuff that these animals eat? Um, and I think we need to know more about that. Um, before we look at, you know, in addition to, you know, all the, the charismatic animals that we know and love. So when people are eating lobster, when people are eating salmon, anything that comes out of the ocean, there's a real good possibility that they could be consuming plastic. Yes. Uh, there has been research that has found that plastic doesn't only end up in, in the stomachs of fish and the, animals, but it can also end up in their gills as well as um, blood tissue and muscle tissue, depending on the animal. 
but that is a whole literature review that we don't have time to go over in this podcast. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So I don't people people think of when they throw a plastic bottle in their garbage. I don't know if they have any idea where that plastic bottle is going to end up at. Well, and I think you you hit the nail on the head. It's not well communicated to the public what happens to our trash, or if the information is out there, it's not easily available. Well, it's out of sight, out of mind. I haven't seen many uh, exactly very uh, large landscape paintings or photographs of landfills in people's offices. <laughs> nobody decorates. That'd be a new one. <laughs> nobody decorates with that. Um, however, there has to be an end to space to to dump these things. There has to be an yeah. end to it. And I would probably suspect that there's a lot of illegal dumping in the ocean. I would suspect, but that is not my area of uh, expertise. Um, But technically, it is if you are out on a boat and you're sailing, um, there are certain areas where you can dump biological materials and then you are not supposed to dump anything like solid trash overboard. You're supposed to take it to shore with you and dispose of it properly. Well, I see pictures of uh, garbage islands that are Mm -hmm. floating in this. And fishing nets. There's a lot of fishing gear that gets just thrown overboard and never brought back to shore. That's a really big issue. Well, there's been a lot of talk recently about all the space debris that's being put up there. Uh, (laughs) We don't think we spend enough time about talking about the debris that we're putting on Earth. when we talk about these things, I think of that young lady from Sweden and uh, how Greta, and she seems to be uh, given little credence uh, because she's so young, maybe, uh, but she's presenting a lot of facts. So do you anticipate being able to present credible evidence and have it believed by hopefully credible people? I am hoping that at the end of the day, like I said, I can, um, the most of my research is descriptive. So that means it's, it's very credible. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that at the end of the day, I can share this with the state parks and they can take it and hopefully stay in communication with them and share it with the appropriate, um, state and federal agencies, uh, to begin to make change. And, There's a whole group of us down here in Texas that do uh, plastics research and um, we're all sticking together um, to trying to figure out how do we, how do we communicate to the public like that? This isn't just us being scientists, but this, this really impacts them as well. Please check out our website at fishingwithoutfaith.com where you can listen to the show comment on our discussions, and find out where you can subscribe to our podcast. If you're interested in flying the colors of Fishing Without Bait, click the shop icon on our website. We have clothing, mugs, cell phone cases, and so much more. Show the world that you fish without bait. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.